Good evening, good evening. Good stuff. I did not see this coming at all. Um, <laughs> Jason's is perfect. <laughs> okay. I'm not gonna, like Jason, we don't need to go into the whole story of that. I know that's probably all you're going to think about by the time you leave tonight. It's just like, why is Jason's picture so perfect for him? Um, you, have to, <laughs> you have to ask him uh, some other time. Um, Meet Me in the Cave Part 2. Last week we talked about just, uh, and we're, we're going to continue talking about the same two characters, King David, the second king of Israel, uh, and Elijah the prophet, one of the great prophets of Israel who, who came um, after David's time. And this, these moments where God takes him into the cave. And we talked some about being in a cave. It, it's, it's a, if you've been in a cave before, it, it can be kind of a, a, a tingling, spine-tingling experience. It can be scary to be stuck in the dark and not be able to see and every sound and, and rock you stump it into um, just kind of brings fear to the surface. Our mind does funny things. And, and really it's true whether you're in a cave or not, but darkness in general just tends to do that. And as I was thinking this week, uh, I have an icebreaker story into like times where I've dealt with, with darkness. Uh, one story came to mind that's uh, pretty funny. Um, as many of you know, I grew up in Winthrop over in the Cascade Mountains. We have lots of wildlife, or as I like to tell my wife, we have lots of nature. And uh, and my senior year, September, school had just started. My girlfriend at the time and a buddy of mine and his girlfriend, we were, were hanging out outside, and it was a warm evening. And we decided, I was like, hey, let's take a walk down to the river, which was probably about, I don't know, 300 yards from our house through the woods. And there was a, it was a kind of an access road that was kind of small. And, and so we're walking down. And it was a lightly overcast night. We could see, but we could not see well. It's one of those nights where you're walking, and you maybe see about four or five feet in front of you real well, and then everything gets real fuzzy pretty quick. And so we're trying to make sure we're staying on the road. And we're laughing and talking. And, and we get to the riverbank. And the, and the river has receded because it's, it's late in the year. And so there's about a two-foot soft drop, and then onto just river rock that go about 40, you know, 40, 50 yards in towards what's left of the river in the center. And we stop, and we go, what's that noise? And we can't see anything. And there's this going on. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is that? And like I shared last week, being the knucklehead that had to lower himself into the hole of the cave when we dropped the when I dropped the flashlight down the hole, I look at my three friends and I go, I'll go check it out. <laughs> Got to be the tough guy. And so I make my way down the bank, and I'm coming across the rocks. And, 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 and there's this, I already knew where we were because I knew the part of the river real well because where we go swimming where two small tributaries kind of came together and the river got bigger. And I knew there was a down tree with a huge, probably like eight-foot-high uh, stump root um, system that had been exposed from the flooding. It got knocked over. And so there's a tree, and this shadow is coming off the bottom of the river. And I hear this, ah, 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 and I'm like, what is it? And I'm thinking, it's a couple of raccoons fighting over maybe a fish or something. And I get closer, and I get closer, and I get maybe maybe to about from maybe to where Chris is here in the front row over on the left. I'm looking, and I was like, those are some big raccoons. And, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, about 20 feet away, stands up a figure in the shadows. And there's a white spot on the chest, and I immediately know what it is because the day before on the way to school, driving by the river from my house, I saw a black bear mother with her two cubs, and she had a white spot on her chest. <sighs> Don't breathe. What do I do? Sweet Jesus, save me. <laughs> and so I, I remember looking at her as she stands up, and then she dropped back into the shadows, kind of the bushes that are near her, and she, I can hear her. She's coming towards me, but I cannot see her. And I'm looking at these two cubs who could care less, and I still all I hear is rah, 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 as they're gnawing on each other. And I remember I just start thinking, I can't run. My dad has a fantastic story about running from grizzly bears in Alaska, so in my mind, I'm thinking, do not run. Do not run. So I start walking backwards real slow. And this mother bear proceeds to stay at the same distance for about, I don't know, 50 to 70 yards as I'm walking over river boulders backwards in the middle of the night all alone. And she just walks me down the edge of the river till she feels I'm far enough away from her babies. And then she stops and continues to watch me as I go. And when I get to a place where I feel confident enough, I start to make my way through the bushes where there is no trail, blindly, not seeing, getting slapped in the face by branches constantly, finally making my way back home, probably a good half an hour later, to find my girlfriend, my buddy, and his girlfriend just sitting on the couch and going, what happened? Where, where did you go? And I remember thinking at that moment, it's like, you were the worst friends in the world. 
You are the worst friends in the world. It was a mother bear and her cubs. Well, why'd you go down there? I don't got a real good answer. But I remember the entire walk back being angry at them and still afraid, thinking like, maybe she's going to change her mind. And I'm going to hear this, <laughs> and like bushes moving. And I'm just going to, where am I going to go? I'll run into a tree if I start sprinting. I can't see a thing. I'm getting slapped in the face as it is and going like, this is it. If she comes after me, I'm dead. I'm dead. And <laughs> Sometimes the darkness can be a good time for us to come face to face with a lot of fears. It can be a good time for us to really see what we're made of. It can, it can show us what we're truly afraid of, what we're made of. And we talked about that is that the Hebrew word for cave um, means to be made bare or to be exposed and made naked. And we talked last week about how Elijah and David in these seasons where they ended up in the caves, that God was exposing their heart and their motives for what they were doing. He was, he was showing who they really were. In a season where they were in dark places, they were oppressed, they were being chased by kings and queens, and their lives were on the line. And, and, and we looked at, at Elijah and how he, he really didn't handle it too well. Kind of like me on the riverbank, he gets, he gets close to his destination and he tells his servant, you just stay here, don't go any farther. And so he goes it alone. But David went, with friends, and we discussed how there was a difference in their perspective of what they saw God doing um, in this season, and that both men were fed by God. David, the bread of presence in the temple, and Elijah literally was fed by God um, with bread and water brought to him when he was too tired on the journey. And we talked about this idea that God will drive us into caves. He will, there will be seasons in our life where we will be driven into a cave. We will be driven into circumstances that are dark and scary, and we really can't see what's going on around us. And this idea of God feeding us comes from the idea that the bread that David ate is the bread of presence. In other words, that it is the bread that stays near the Holy of Holies, that we sustain ourselves in these dark times by seeking the presence of the Lord and His Word. And we looked at how David responds in the cave to saying, God, I will worship you and I will praise you for your word. And he has a heart posture of even in this dark time when King Saul, the first king, his mentor, his father-in-law, is literally trying to kill him, that he finds confidence and strengthens himself in the Lord, writing this psalm in this cave, saying, God, your word is where I, from where I will praise you, because what you have said will sustain me. And we see Elijah runs to the cave, and God feeds him with bread, and he gets there, and, and God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah does the me, me, me act. He goes, I have been very jealous for you, God. And all of Israel has, has profaned your word and they're, they're bowing down to idols and they've killed your prophets. And I and I alone am the only one who has served you and I am the only one left. And then God comes, crushes rocks with wind and an earthquake happens inside the mountain of the cave and then, then fire licks the hillside and then God comes in a still, quiet voice. And he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says the same thing again. He just doesn't seem to get what God is trying to do. And so tonight, I want to I look at what God does. Last week, we really talked a lot about these cave seasons are for God to expose us of where we really put our faith, what we're really worried about, and for him to speak to us in the stillness and the quiet that in these seasons where it is dark in our life, that God is trying to say something to make us more like his son, speak to us so that we'd be more like his son and, and give us direction in our life. But we have to stop, as Elijah, he covered his face completely. We have to stop. We have to sometimes bring ourselves to a place of silence and solitude to actually hear the Lord. That in our society of technology everywhere and social media, it is almost impossible to have a real communion and conversation with God with so much distraction going on around us. And if we don't bring ourselves to the cave to meet God, that dark place, that quiet place where God can actually speak, we often, even in the most distressing times, will not hear what the Lord has for us. We get taken to the cave, not to get lost and left in the dark, but to train our focus on how to be led by the light, which is God in his word.
God doesn't bring us in these dark places. He doesn't ask us to get silent before him so that he would never speak, but he's trying to train us how to follow him in the darkness of circumstances and the doubt of our minds of how things are going to turn out. He wants us to learn to listen to his voice, to still our hearts and our heads and listen to his voice no matter what the circumstances are. And so we have two choices. We can either be drawn to the cave, which we're promised we will be. Jesus says there will be persecution and trials in this life. If you think that the blessings of God means that you will not have hardships, you've been listening to the wrong gospel because Jesus promises us hardships, but he promises us his peace and his joy and his power of his Holy Spirit and that he will never leave us. And so you're going to have hard times, but what do we do? Do we, do we actually learn about God and do we learn about who we are in him in those seasons? Or do we just cry out like Elijah to point fingers of blame and to find excuses for why we're here and to try to shift the subject onto someone else or some other circumstances, the reason for us being there? But God's trying to do something to us in the cave. He's bringing us there to teach us a lesson. He's bringing us there to make him make us more like him. But I am a slow learner. I'm a very slow learner. Because as I reflected more this last week on these two stories of David in the cave of Adullam and Elijah on Mount Horeb in his cave, I, I realized that my heart, I often tend to be more like Elijah. I tend to see my situations in my darkness is something unique, like no one else understands what I'm going through. It's easier to find, uh, I think for all of us, it's easier to find ourselves in a situation where when we're going through hardships and we want out, no one else understands is maybe the thought process we start to have, or they don't understand the details. And, and we start to feel unjustly dealt with by God, by other people, um, misunderstood. There's all these things. And some of that can be very true. The fact is, is that our experiences can be true, but they can also not be the whole truth and not share the whole picture of what's actually going on. And we are limited, no matter how close to a situation we are or how clearly we think we're seeing it, any situation that, that is good or bad, we don't see the whole picture. It reminded me of, of kind of a, a wisdom story about four men, and I, and I think they were blind, but for the purpose of this illustration, we'll say that they're blindfolded, and they're taken to an object, and they're asked to, to feel around this object and, and tell this person, what is it that you're experiencing? And the first man goes and he grasps and it's strong and leathery and it's moving around in all sorts of directions and it's, and it's just going this way and that way. And he goes, I am holding a snake. This is definitely a snake. It can be no other thing. And the man goes, oh, that's good. And he goes to the second man who's blindfolded. He goes, what do you feel? And the guy's going, it, it, it's just, it's rough and hard and it's wide and it's girth and it just feels strong and stable, unmovable. I believe I'm holding on to a tree. And the guy goes, that's good, that's good. And he goes to the third guy and he goes, I, I, I cannot find anything to touch, but I can feel the wind as if someone is taking large palm leaves and he's blowing in my face. And I think, I think I'm being fanned by leaves from a palm tree. He goes, that's good. And he goes to the last man. The last man goes, none of these men are feeling this right. It is smooth and hard and a point. It is a spear that I am touching. And then the man takes all four blindfolds off and all four men realize that they're standing at different places around an elephant. And none of them were right, and yet all of them were 100% right in what they experienced. In the darkness of where God takes us in the cave, oftentimes we grope and we cannot see if all we are looking for is a reason for our circumstances. And we will not know the truth of the whole totality of what God is trying to do unless we stop and we ask to see how God sees if we stop and we go, look, I, I'm not sure I, what this is, Lord. What I'm experiencing is a lot of pain, and, and I'm starting to have bitterness in my heart or depression, all these things, because all I see right now is that this circumstance is going to lead me in one direction, and there's, I don't see any hope for this turning out this way. But unless we are to stop and remove ourselves from the equation and our experience as the final authority of what we're thinking we're experiencing, and step back and go, God, now what do you see here? What is it that you want me to see? What is it that you're trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me about you and who I need to be in this moment? We can then start to learn what it is to take value from the cave, from these dark times. But if we just rest, if we just rest in our own experiences, we have a limited view. And what tends to happen is when we're resting our own experiences, we have a hard time finding our way out of the cave. 
If you're blindfolded and you're already in a dark cave, it's real tough to find your way out by just groping around. And what happens when we're in these seasons for a long time and we're not hearing or seeing what God is saying and we're not turning our hearts to actually see the Lord for who he is or wanting to find out what the Lord is trying to do in us, but we're just trying to find an escape route or just trying to find somewhere to put the blame is that we can often isolate like Elijah did. He took his own servant and said, don't go any further, and he went alone to the mountain. And as he gets there, even though there was a servant who was with him the whole time, he tells God that no one is left. Well, he just left a man back there on the road. But because he's been alone, he has isolated himself in the, in the season of this cave experience. He now feels like there's no one left, and that's all he can declare is true. Or we can do it the other way. I tend to isolate, but some of us, we tend to grab on the people and thinking that people can be our answer for hope and fulfillment in those seasons of darkness. And we start to expect and put our hope in people. And what happens is people let people down because we're just people. And then we get bitter and angry at each other for not being what we hoped we would be for each other. Why weren't you there for me? How come you didn't call? How come you didn't show up? I needed you. Where were you? And it all becomes about what we're not getting and they're not giving. And we should be here to help each other. We should be a people that loves on each other. And while that experience and that reality is true, it is not the whole truth and it is not the purpose of why God has you in a dark season of your life. Depression is an evil thing. I remember about eight years ago, the last time I went through real, real heavy depression that didn't seem to shake. Um, I remember I found myself secluding. I stopped going to church here for a little while. Um, and I, I remember being on the edge of my bed, down in my basement, room that I was renting from a friend and I was softly pounding my head against the wall and saying, God, I just don't want to live anymore. I'm at a place where I, I'm not going to kill myself. I, I know you're doing something here, but I don't feel, I don't feel like there's any hope in this situation and I don't want to press on anymore. I would, I would really appreciate if you would take me out of this, but if not, you need to speak because I need some help. And the next day I found myself at the foot of the bed, just kind of crying silently, laying on the floor at the foot of my bed and the door, uh, I had a knock on my door and my roommate opened and he says, some people are here to see you. And Pastor Mike and his daughter, Sarah, came in and it's real simple. All they did is they just took me for a ride. I think we got some food and they just asked me some questions. I just spent time with some people that I know loved me. I'd like to say that everything broke in that moment, but it didn't. But there was a little glimmer of hope because someone showed up. I had isolated myself for so long that hope itself started to die, not because circumstances were getting great, greater and greater uh, against me. They weren't getting worse and worse, rather. But I started to lose hope because I was alone. Not because people had really ran from me, although that's what my thoughts were telling me, but because I had ran from people and decided that in this hardship, in this cave season, in this dark time, it's best if I just do this alone. So we tend to go one of two ways, and maybe you're already thinking about which way is you. We isolate, or we cling to people or things, and we try to find hope in these dark seasons that something else will suffice and give us energy and hope and life in the midst of a dark time. But there is another option. We lean into God, into his presence and his word, and we let him. We let him guide us through the cave season and completely strip us bare to expose the heart issues that we're actually dealing with inside of us. And you might be thinking right now that my cave season has nothing to do with my heart. It is just a circumstance. Somebody has come against me. It's nothing I've done. There's nothing of my part in this. It is something that has befallen upon me, and there's nothing I can do to change it. And so this just needs to change. That's the only thing that needs to happen in my cave season right now is this circumstance needs to change. But I'm telling you what I've experienced in life and what men and women who have gone before me, who have walked closely with the Lord, is that God is always doing something in our heart. And he uses every circumstance, whether it comes from the devil himself 
or God is testing you, no matter what the circumstance in your life is, he is using it to do something to form in you, to form in me, to form in us more of his son, more character of Jesus coming alive in us, more hope and joy and peace that, that comes from him and not from our circumstances. He is trying to solidify, make a strong foundation so that he can build upon us the thing that he has created us to do. But will we see it? I feel like for some of us tonight in our hearts, you need to hear the son, daughter, that I'm developing me and you right now. And the injustice may be real, the circumstance may be completely ungodly and unbearable, but what I am doing right now, for sure, is I'm developing me and you. And will you embrace me in the dark? Will you hold on to me no matter what your feelings tell you in this season. So Elijah, God asks Elijah the second time, Elijah, what are you doing here? In 1 Kings 19, verse 14, Elijah replies again for the second time, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, am left. They seek my life now to take it away. I would expect God to say, man, I'm really sorry and I see what you're going through and I'm here with you. I love you, son. You've done such a good job. This is God's return. Go return the way you came. To the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, this is Elijah with a J, but Elisha, S-H. The son of Shaphat of Abel, Meholoah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel all knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah, it's all about you. Here's my response. Go be about somebody else. And by the way, you're not nearly as alone as you think you are. Stop isolating yourself, son. Go back from where you came. The meaning of the town Damascus is silent is a sackcloth, sackcloth wear. Sackcloth, they would wear sackcloth and put ashes on their head when they'd be mourning or loss in Jewish custom. And it's almost like God saying, I want you to go back to the place of your brokenness and I want you to be quiet and I want you to be about other people. There's two people that need to be anointed and there's a prophet that needs to rise up to do my will. Will you be with me despite how you feel the world is treating you right now. That's heavy. This isn't the loving God that we often talk about. It doesn't feel that way, like the loving God who says, I'm going to come around you. I'm going to make you fly on the wings of eagles. And even though lions grow weary, the young lions grow weary, you will not with me. All those promises are true, but they're true in him and where he is. Jesus says, wherever my, my I am and my servant is, my father will honor him and will be with him. You see, the idea isn't Jesus always just coming to meet me and my needs in the darkness. It's me actually going to where Jesus is, no matter what my circumstances are, so that God can actually start to honor me with the promises that his word has. If we sit in our darkness and we're all about us, 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 and we don't look to where Jesus is and where Jesus is moving, where Jesus is calling us to, how can we expect to steward the freedom from our darkness if we can't steward the opportunities to bless someone else? in them. So Elijah, to his credit, he moves. The next verse, in verse 19, so he departed from there and he found Elisha. He finds Elisha. He goes and he at least starts on one of the three. He goes, I'm going to go find this dude. And he finds him and he throws his coat on him. And there's this really interesting exchange about how Elisha comes to follow uh, Elijah. But that's not the point tonight. But he actually goes and he finds Elijah. 
even though there is nothing that God has said other than there's 7,000 others that haven't bowed their knee. You're not alone. You're not alone. I am with you. I have a job for you. And Elijah goes. In our good times, when life is good, how often, ask ourselves this question, how often do we actually look to bless other people? Like on, on a daily basis, do I actually look to bless other people when stuff is going good? Now, when things aren't so easy, how often do I look in the midst of my own pain and my own desire for deliverance, do I look to bless other people? Do I go and find them? I was very humbled by the reality of what the Lord asked me. That question, I'm not asking you guys that just to be just a jerk tonight. That's literally something I've been wrestling with this week is do I actually go look for people when it's good, and how much less do I look for people when I don't feel like things are going well for me? Am I really about other people, or am I just conveniently serving that best fits my skill set, something that doesn't cost me too much, and I'm just going to serve and be as long as it's convenient for me? Elijah has to go find Elisha, and he does. David's heart was much different. Man, for a guy that made a lot of mistakes, his heart is beautiful. He's in the cave of Adullam, like I said, and it, his father-in-law, his king, is trying to kill him, and he's bad-mouthing him all over the place, and David is on the run for his life with a few men. And he writes, he writes this in Psalm 56 in this time, Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you and God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Who can, what can flesh do to me? He continues on in, in verse 9. This, is, this I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? His circumstances are really no different from Elijah. They're both being hunted by a king, or Elijah's case, a queen that want to kill them, and they're hiding in a cave somewhere, and you have two very different heart responses. You have Elijah whining about his circumstances and everybody else's lack of action in, in this world, and then you have David going, oh, oh, this is a bummer. This is a real bummer. But man, God, are you good. And in your word, I'm going to continue to praise you despite my circumstances. I'm in this dingy cave. I was living in the king's palace. I was in charge of ten thousands of people in the army. And now I'm living in a cave running for my life. But your word is good, and I'm going to praise you. And it's amazing that God speaks and has to send Elijah in that season. But for David, he brings him help in the cave. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1, says this, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who is in distress, everyone who is in debt, and everyone who is bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became captain over them. And there with him were about 400 men. He ain't so alone now. Now, it's not your A-list people. These are not the people you want to have showing up when you're having a bad day. It's the people who are broke and poor. Dave, I know you're having a hard time. Can you spare a buck, though? It's, it's the people that are oppressed and, and they're squeezed. It says in a narrow place. The Hebrew means a narrow place. They're squeezed. And so David's hiding in a cave for his life, and the people come to him and like, man, I've had it really hard. Can I, can I kick it with you? Can I stay on your couch, David? That rock over there looks flat enough. I'll take that one. Because life's just, I'm just in a bad place. And then bitter of soul, these people are just angry. Life has been unfair, and they're complaining about it. They are bitter of soul. Have you ever been around someone who's just bitter of soul? There's nothing good going on. You're like, man, it's a beautiful sunny day. This is the first day over, the, over 70 degrees. Yeah, well, I'm sweating already. I can't believe you even like this. It's 10 a.m. Just going to get worse from here today. And it's like, <laughs> leave you in your place. These are the type of people that show up to, for, to David's cave, not his palace. He's not feeding them out of his abundance. He's a broken man himself, and God sends these kind of people, and David writes that kind of psalm. It's a different heart posture because David already had God's heart that when he knew by pursuing the presence of God, by putting his faith in God's word, that 
God loves His children. And anyone that came to David was going to be welcomed. And I thought about why would these people come to David? Like King Saul is raiding the Philistines and he's having success as a king and David is an outcast. Why would 400 men choose David? And I believe in Samuel 18, there's this small little set of scripture right after David's promoted in Saul's army. And it says this in verse 14 of chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all of Israel and Judah loved David, for he went in and out and came in before them. And the Lord said two things. There's a reason why people will join to you in your cave. One is if they see you're a person who is about God in his presence. If you're a person who puts your eyes on the Lord in all your circumstances and gives praise to God and seeks the Lord in all your circumstances, that is an attractive quality to have. You're feeling lonely and like no one's holding up their end of the deal. Be a person who speaks life out of the promises of God's word in the midst of your darkness. And secondly, he was a person who went in and out amongst them. He is the most famous man in Israel and yet common people knew him. He was a lover of people. David understand that life was about relationships. It was about a relationship with his heavenly father that he held very clearly and dearly to his heart that everyone could see and it changed the way he operated. It changed the way he spoke and how he treated people. And then he was also a lover of people that people came and he went in and out amongst them and everyone was welcomed in David's presence. And it drew people to him. Despite the fact of his circumstances, people were actually drawn to David because in the midst of his circumstances, he was still a man who turned his eyes to the only light he had in his cave, which was his Lord, his God. And he loved the people that God brought to him. Despite who they were or how they acted, he loved them anyways. It was funny is that it's easy in life to kind of pick and choose who we're going to not even be nice to, but who we're really going to give our time to. And, and, and there's some wisdom sometimes to pouring your life into somebody, and if they're not responding and growing in the Lord, um, th th there's a time where you, you, you know, as the Bible says, you, you kick the dust off your sandals, you move on, because as, as a sister here has told me that was really wise, is they're not ready to receive and to grow in the Lord, or they're not ready to receive what God has for them. And Jesus does this in his ministry where he offers something and people don't meet the standard that he offers and he just moves on. And so there's times where we, I'm not trying to tell us, uh, all of us here tonight that, that we have to just give up everything for every person and be all things to all people in every circumstance and just bend over backwards and be railroaded and run over by every circumstance and individual. That, that There is wisdom in this, but the heart is, is that I'm for God and I'm for people that we would have a heart as a people that says, I'm for God, I'm for relationships, just not for people in my thoughts, but I actually want to engage life. I'm in and out amongst people, living life with people. Because those men, those men who came to him in this season of his life, for this next seven, this next ten to, seven to ten years of his life, as he is in between wildernesses and different caves in David's life, these men become men of renown. These broke, bitter-souled, oppressed people became men who take down giants, who stand in fields and fight whole armies by themselves, who kill 300 men as one man, who do amazing exploits and completely rout their enemies every time they face challenge. I felt like the Lord says that when we're in the cave, oftentimes we can always be about ourselves. But if we start being about other people, even the people that maybe don't look like they have anything to offer us, maybe especially the people that don't look like they have anything to offer us, you just might see God create a mighty warrior out of somebody because of your love for him and your love for them. God wants to do two things in your cave. He wants to teach you how to be more like his son and fill you with more of his spirit, and he wants to show you how to love and serve other people well so that he can start raising up the army that he promised to raise up. The fullness of God's power in your life and through it will only come when you fully commit to him as the love of your life and you commit to his community 
which is the church. And that might sting for some of us with bad experiences in church. I've had plenty. Matter of fact, as long as I've been in church and as the, the different places I've gone and sacrificed for church, I would argue that in some cases, I probably have more than most. But this is also the place where God has done the greatest work in my life. I've seen in the last 10 years of this church when people commit to community, when 35 people met in Mike and Lisa's upper room of their house and prayed about what God wanted to do, and then they founded this church over 10 years ago, what's happened, that we have been, we have been welcomed and encouraged in the bars, feeding people and sharing the gospel. We, we have held all sorts of activities out in that street. We've seen probably hundreds to hundreds of people saved. We baptized probably well over 100 people in the last 10 years. That's not astonishing numbers, but God has moved. We've seen people broken from addiction. We've seen healing of limbs, headaches, uh, the back injuries. We've seen shoulder injuries healed here in this very, very place on Sunday services at other times. We have seen God move in amazing ways. And I have seen women and men who have given themselves to the Lord and to His people actually grow and things inside of them start to surface and come alive that they never thought were in there and I guarantee you the rest of us never knew were in there either but God started to work in their heart and mind and all of a sudden something beautiful started to come out of people's lives because they were people who dedicated themselves to loving God and pouring themselves into this community and I'm not talking about just showing up on Sundays and serving there's there's basic needs I mean really engaging in life with each other really coming together and being a people who value one another and really, as Paul says, consider one another more valuable than themselves who pour out their lives and go, I, I think about when I wake up these individuals and I pray for them and I want them to have the best of what God has for them. That kind of lifestyle, when people have engaged in that kind of perspective, no matter whether you're in a cave or on a mountaintop, God has done amazing things in this house. Amazing things in this house. There are certain things in your life that will only change through community because it's not about you and Jesus. That is a lie that the first world wants to tell us in our faith. It's just me and Jesus. It's just me and Jesus and my personal relationship with Jesus. Bull crap. They didn't understand that concept in the third world Eastern culture of Jesus' times and they never preached it. Ever. It's never about you and Jesus. It's about Jesus in you for the sake of the world. It's about Jesus in you for the coming of the kingdom and the power of God to be released on this place. There's a testimony of something that happened. Uh, Steph uh, got baptized here a couple months ago, and it was a, her testimony was amazing just by being a neighbor uh, to Joel and Alan. And uh, recently, Joel and Alan, they have three beautiful little children with their, their youngest one um, uh, seemingly has been uh, just a terror at night as of late. Uh, what, 10, 12 times a night up, having a suit, just crying out? And, and, and Joel and Alan are amazing. They're an amazing couple of faith. Like You would be lucky to have them in your life, and God moves when they pray, and God moves when they serve, and, and, and they've been waking up night in and night out, over and over every night, just exhausted, um, trying to put their youngest daughter back to sleep, and, and they've been praying over her. They've done all sorts of things that the Bible talks about, and then Joel sat on Emmeline's bed one night, in the middle of the night, and she was just exasperated. She's in this cave moment of just sleep deprivation and responsibilities and life with three little kids under six years old and just going, oh my gosh, what do I do? She, and she goes, who, Lord, who do you want me to reach out to? And the Lord said, I want you to call Steph. And so, I don't know if it was that night. It was probably the next, wasn't that night, middle of the night? You bold thing, you, I like it. <laughs> Calls her friend who wakes up and her and her husband pray for Emmeline and she hasn't had any problems since, has she? How long ago was that? Two weeks, every night, 10 to 12 times a night waking up and then because of community, because of community, of willingness to engage in life and relationship that's built that Joel has the confidence to call a friend in the middle of the night and say, will you pray for my youngest daughter? Everything changed. There are things in our life that we can labor for and pray for, but they will not shift until we start to love the thing that God loves most, and that's people. You can do all the Bible studies you want. You can fast all you want. You can do all these things, but unless your life is committed to the thing that He 
is committed from the throne of heaven, which is the saving and loving of his people. You will not see certain things come to fruition in your life. You will not see certain bondages break on your life. You will not see the fullness of the power of God released in you and through you until you become so radically changed that your love for God turns your eyes to look, how can I love people? No matter what the season is. I want to close with this thought. Jason taught on this a little bit, and we heard an amazing pastor from Southern California talk about this. Matthew 16. Many of you might be familiar with it. They have too many tabs. They're not color-coded well enough. Matthew 16, verse 13. And Jesus came into the district of Caesarea... <laughs> Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will build my church. His first issue of order after the revelation of who he is, which is God in the flesh, is I'm going to build me a church. And he wasn't talking about a building. He's talking about all his children coming together and being perfectly one. That's what he's building. All his children, by the power of his spirit, coming together to be perfectly one. I'm going to build this church on that statement. That Jesus is the Son of God, and by him alone are we saved. By His grace, not our good works, but because He died and rose again, we find freedom and life and hope in Him forever and ever. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's interesting, where Caesarea Philippi is, is one of the three headways of the Jordan River. In this spot, there's this bubbling brook in a cave. And there's a good chance that Jesus is sitting at this, this, this cultic a uh, place of worship where pagan worship uh, come, the people come to worship Pan, which is a half goat, half man with hooves and horns on his head, demon, right? So they come to worship this guy, and Pan is where we derive the word panic, where fear comes from. It's this god of fear. It's this, it's this god of mischief and music and, and myrrh, but he also, when he spoke, as Jason talked about uh, a while back, is that it would paralyze. The idea is it would paralyze people, fear that paralyzes. And there was this pool there inside the cave that was very still, and they would come and they would kill their animals, and they'd put the blood in the water of the pool, and the pool, they didn't know the depth of it, they couldn't find the depth of it. And they, we've now later found it's over 800 feet deep, but in Jesus' times, they could not find the depth of this pool. And so they thought it was access to the underworld, and the blood, because of the unique flow of this pool, would get pulled down, and people thought that when they sacrificed their animals, they were actually sacrificing to the god of death, to Pan, and that when the blood went down in the water, it was being accepted. This was a place where people sacrificed sacrifice to death at the doors of hell. And Jesus is standing there on this confession, on this confession that I am God, I will build my church, and these gates, this pool, this gateway to hell, it can't prevail against none of that. That what I'm establishing now is so powerful and so true that there is nothing that you've ever seen or experienced that is going to overcome what I am doing, and that is building my church on one true fact, that I alone am God in the flesh, and that if you have your faith in me, nothing can separate you from me. This is the thing that we come together on. This is the thing that we, the reason why we're here. But what Jesus desired of us was not just to come on a Sunday and to listen to some young idiot talk about things he really doesn't know too much about because otherwise his life would look different. But what he wants us to do is actually engage one another on the principles of who he is. Sacrificial love, living with one another in such a gracious way that we would allow space for each other to learn and to grow. That we'd be compassionate, meeting each other's needs. That we would actually be the Acts 2 church that they dedicated themselves to the teaching of the word of God to the apostles teaching about Jesus to prayers to gathering together living life in and amongst one another to breaking bread sharing meals and sharing life and that we would give to one another as we have need 
that this lifestyle, that this is what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. And when we live like this, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what we see in Acts, not only do these gates of hell not prevail against it, the gates of this earth can't stand it either. And people get saved and God moves and healing happens and the miraculous becomes commonplace. Not because people have found secret ways to pray or enter time in the cave just for me, but because from the place of cave, from the quiet place of meeting with God, we learn to love each other well. Family, we are starting home groups on that foundation that home groups are going to be more than just doing a Bible study, that when we get involved in home groups, what we really want to see happen is we want to see family formed. That we would actually see each other more valuable than ourselves, that the way the home groups are being structured right now, what Thomas is working on in between his naps, is that we would actually be a people who give to each other, that we spend time with each other, that we pray for each other, and that we challenge each other in the Word, but more than that, that we just live life together and truly love each other. Some of us are in our cave experiences still tonight, and we're having a hard time seeing any hope. And the truth is, is that hope is in Jesus, but Jesus is here, and Jesus is in the people to your left and the people to your right. And if you really want the hope of Jesus, you're going to have to lower some walls, be a little vulnerable, show some grace, because there's some weirdos here. I is one of them. And we are going to have to learn to love each other real well. Even Spock. <laughs> home groups are a place where we want to build safe a safe place for people to share what's going on in their lives where people are compassionate and filled with grace where they can experience real family maybe like you never have before one of the biggest moments of my life One of the biggest moments of my life was that same senior year. No, I'm sorry. It was the year before. It was my junior year of high school. And there was a new youth pastor who came into town. He was a weirdo. And he called me in a real effeminate voice. And he liked music that I didn't think was okay for guys to like. And uh, he was a new Christian. One year into his faith. One year into his faith. Not raised in a Christian home. Never heard the gospel until about his senior year of high school. And he called me up and he said, hey, I heard you, you know, you're one of the few Christians in town. And it was true. And he goes, I'm trying to form a Bible study of young guys in the high school to just get together and talk about Jesus and life. And I think it'd be good. And I show up the first night and it's him and the pastor of another church's son who we did not get along. And so here's this one weirdo who's 20 years old and Luke, who I did not like. Well, <laughs> I'm making it sound way worse than it was. Talk for two hours. I don't even remember the questions Chris asked. The, the new youth pastor who has been a Christian for one year, 20 years old, asked a few key questions. Then he prayed for us. And I drove home, and I remember exactly where I was between my house and the church that I was leaving. And I started crying so hard I couldn't see the road, and I thought I was going to crash. Because what I didn't realize in the depths of my heart is that I needed community, and I hadn't had it before. But I felt like, and I grew up in a good Christian home. My parents are here tonight, and they did an amazing job pouring God's love into me and pointing me towards God's word. But I had never had community where I felt like I could actually open up about my life and about where I struggled and who I thought God was or where I struggled believing God, who God might not be and, and what do I do with all these things and, and all these questions. And I finally had a place where I could talk about that openly with two guys who accepted me as me and pointed me to Jesus. And I hadn't even seen any fruit from it and I bawled and I almost had to pull over. If you're going through a hard time right now, I'm promising you community groups will be difficult some nights. It will be. We are weird. Get used to it. Accept it. You might as well look in the mirror and own it as well. But this is the place where God's love and power pours out the most is amongst his people. There is no you in Jesus. Not unless you're John in prison. Then you might get real lucky and Jesus comes in a real powerful way and rocks your world one night. But there's no you and Jesus alone. Jesus is here to build a church. And that means the church has to be about loving each other real well. Community groups isn't the answer, but it's one of the things we want to do to help initiate a culture to where we can be people who truly love and serve one another with all that we have. And get to know each other and actually be friends. You can make friends with weirdos it makes your life more interesting.
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for 10 years, 10 years in this building. I thank you for all the relationships, those who have come and gone, those who are here tonight. Lord, you have big things planned as you're moving us forward into this season, Lord. I thank you for what you're speaking to us. I thank you that even in these dark times for some of us uh, going through cave seasons, that we are not alone, that there are others who have been there, there are others who are there, and that we have people, if we would reach out, we have people who understand, who would, who would give us a hug, who would pray for us, who would, who would show us that we're not alone. And Lord, you have something in this for us to be more like you, and you have something in this for us to bless and serve someone else, and we will find more joy, more power, peace, uh, and, and just hope in that than anything else. Lord, help us turn our perspective. Lord, we repent of our ways of thinking of, of protecting ourselves in dark, lonely seasons. Lord, we want to see what you see, that even when things got hardest, you pressed in and loved more. You declared more truth, and you spoke with more confidence and more authority. Lord, we want to be people who press into you and press into one another even when it gets hard hard and difficult and dark. And so in Jesus' name, we ask that you would do a work in our heart to bring us to a place of healing and faith to step into community like we never have before. Amen. We love you guys. Sign up. If you have questions about the sign up, Tunap Thomas TNT will be in the back of the Connect Center out there and he will help walk you through how to sign up for a home group. God bless and we'll see you all next Sunday.